a blessed Friday evening to each and every one of you. And uh, again, uh, we are glad that we have come together to worship the Lord. And uh, as you know, we will continue with our uh, study of one of the favorite verses among us, John 3.16. And uh, hopefully you are recalling the past uh, sermons that we have we had, so that you can uh, piece them together to form a, a big picture. And I hope that by the end of this series, you will have a fuller understanding of this verse. John 3, 16. And, okay. We are now on the fourth sermon. This is the fourth uh, installment of our uh, series. And we will be studying what is highlighted in our slide there. Um, shall not perish. <clears throat> so we have studied God so loved the world. And then we have studied He gave His only begotten Son or His only, His one and only Son. And last time we studied whoever believes in Him. Now, uh, so that we may understand what belief or uh, the noun faith really means, <clears throat> let me uh, give you an example. Because there are two kinds of what we call as belief. Belief. To believe. One, one kind is what I call as demonic kind of belief. You cannot deny certain reality. But you do not trust that reality. You do not, uh, you do not uh, love that reality. You do not uh, entrust your life to that reality. And that is the demonic kind of faith. Even the demons believe, the Bible says, that there is but one God. And they even shudder, they even tremble at the thought that there is but one God. However, they do not trust God and they do not entrust themselves to His keeping. In other words, this is the kind of belief that we do not want. You know? The kind of belief that we want is the one that accepts the reality of God and at the same time, trust in Him. That is the kind of belief that we want. <clears throat> to illustrate these two kinds of belief, let me tell you about a story when I was uh, a little boy, like our small boys here. Uh, unfortunately, you may not uh, be able to uh, relate yourself because you have grown uh, here in Qatar and not in our place, where in our place, you know, in the Philippines, there are, there are what we call a circus, right? And you must have uh, seen this in TV, you know, TV shows, there are circus, where you have uh, amazing acts by the circus artists. One time, there was uh, what we call as, what we call as fiesta, right? Feasts <laughs> in our town, in uh, Pampanga. And every, every feast day, every fiesta in our place, you know, there, there are circus that comes in town. And uh, we children, you know, this is what, we were uh, waiting for this circus. And so when the circus uh, started, we were one of the first to get inside and see what amazing acts these uh, acrobats will do. And then 
one of the acts that really caught my attention was this uh, guy who actually uh, walked uh, the rope from one end of the stage to another. So he was uh, balancing, he had some balancing stick, and he was able to uh, walk. <coughs> and then we were amazed, but then he did something more. He was carrying something <laughs> and he walked through the wire <coughs> from one end to the other. And we were all amazed. But the next act was even more amazing because he had one, one man <laughs> on his shoulder and then he walked again through the wire through the rope and he was able to bring the man from one end of the stage to the other walking through the rope and so we were all amazed and uh, clapped our hands <clears throat> but then the man said who among you believe that i can carry you from this point to the next point like i did to this man Everybody raised their hands. I raised mine too because I've seen, you know, I've seen what he did to this man. <clears throat> and then the acrobat said, okay, then I will choose, you know, one among you and I will carry him on my shoulder, right? Uh, carry him from this point to the other point through the rope. And nobody volunteered. See, when the man asked that he could bring us from one end to the other, we were all uh, believing that, you know, because we had sin. But then when he asked one of us you know, to volunteer, go up to the stage so that he could carry him from one end to the other through the rope, nobody, nobody volunteered. So that is what I call the demonic kind of faith. You cannot deny something that is real because you know it's real, but you cannot trust yourself on that reality. So I hope now you can see the difference right, between what we call as biblical faith and the demonic kind of faith. Biblical faith means you believe in something because it is real and you trust that something or someone that you believe in, although you do not see him. Okay? That is biblical faith. All right, so we proceed now to these <clears throat> uh, three words that we will study shall not perish. All right. Before we proceed, let us uh, bow our heads in prayer and implore the blessing of the Lord upon the study of this word. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this wonderful time that you have once again gathered us together as a people to listen to your word that our faith might be edified. Father, we pray that the Holy Spirit might be with us and that he may give us understanding hearts and teachable uh, minds that we may believe what he wants us to be here today. Father, forgive us where we have fallen short of your glory and keep us in peace. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> now, the word perish, the English word perish, is translated from the original Greek opolomi. That's the original Greek. And sometimes we have to go back and really understand what the word means. Because sometimes the English word does not really catch 
the full meaning of the word in the original. So the word apolume means to destroy utterly. That's according to the Greek Strong's Concordance. Now, according to Webster Dictionary, utterly means completely and without qualification, or the synonym is absolutely. In other words, without exception. You will be destroyed without exception. In other words, everything in you will be destroyed. That's what it means. To perish means to be destroyed utterly. Now the question is, why perish? Is God so cruel that he, he would consign people to go to this uh, place to perish? No. There is a reason why there is such a thing as to perish. Now, what do we need to believe in Jesus Christ so that we may not perish? Right? Now, let me explain this by using uh, an example that is that is uh, common, commonly known to us. Now, in every government, like uh, the government of the Philippines, we have laws. Right? And the reason for the laws is so that we may have uh, orderly and peaceful, peaceful relationship with one another. There will be no problems, there will be no, uh, no quarrel among the people. So there are laws governing our relationships. And with these laws come penalties. In other words, if you break the law, you will be punished. Now, where did people get this idea of creating laws in order to govern the relationships of the citizens? And then whoever breaks the law will be punished. Where did they get this idea? You know, in the Philippines, we have laws, and then we have what we call as penal code. These are the penalties if you break these laws. Okay? Where did people, because all nations are governed by laws, where do people get this idea about creating laws and then creating uh, punishments for those who break the law? Where did they get this idea? Well, it is actually God who enlightens them. It is God who gave them the, the principle of law and penalty against violation of the law. It came from God himself. This knowledge, this principle, that in order for a law to be effective, there must be penalty for breaking it. Now, you can just imagine how uh, difficult it would be and how dangerous it would be if you have laws in your country and there are no penalties for breaking the laws. Right? <clears throat> it will be disaster for everyone. It will be very chaotic society. Even if you have laws, there are no penalties against breaking the law. Everybody will break the law because there was no penalty. So God, when he created human beings, and he created other, other beings like the angels, but let's, uh, let's have uh, something that we can relate to, and this is the creation of mankind. Now when God created mankind, he also created the laws governing mankind. And these laws, some of these laws are actually inherent in our nature. When I say inherent, when we say inherent, 
we know them by nature. Nobody, nobody teaches us, but we know them. It is inborn, right? The knowledge of good and evil, which Adam, by the way, acquired when they rebelled against God and disobeyed him, he acquired this knowledge of good and evil. And he has transmitted this to all his children up to our time. We are all children of Adam. So this inherent knowledge of good and evil is with us. Where do you think uh, the children get their, uh, you know, bad behavior? When everything that parents teach them are good manners and right manners. Where do they get this uh, idea of lying? Where do they get this idea of quarreling? Because we parents, we do not teach our children these things. We do not teach them how to lie. We do not teach, in fact, we teach them how to be truthful. We teach them how to be good. But then they, they just, you know, show these bad habits and bad behaviors. Where did this come from? From their own nature. It is built in, right? They know what is good and they know what is evil also. We have all of this. Every human being born with a sound, sound mind has this knowledge of good and evil. That is why even if you go to <clears throat> the remotest uh, tribes in the mountains, you will find that they are following certain rules also. Where did that come from? It came from their own nature of knowing what is good and what is evil. So God's laws are actually written. If we may use uh, some uh, uh, metaphor, God's laws are written in our being. We know what's good and we know what is bad. <clears throat> Even if you do not teach uh, Children or people, they know it is bad to kill. They know it is bad to steal. They know it is bad to take somebody else's property. They know it is bad to lie. And it is bad to dishonor parents. Where did that come from? It is written there in our own very nature. Right? <clears throat> so God's law is some of this is written in our nature. We know it inwardly. We know it inherently. So this is what I call the law of God in nature. Right? And according to the Apostle Paul, because all men has uh, have this inherent law of God in their nature, there is no excuse for anybody. There is no excuse. If you did evil, you don't have any excuse because you know that it's evil. And if you do good, you, know, you will be rewarded by God. So, <clears throat> we have this. Now, the question is, yeah, what does God do when man violates his law? His law. What does he do? Well, just like uh, the governments of the world, there are penalties. But in God's government, there is only one penalty. For all sins, there is only one penalty. By the way, sin in the Bible, right? Is what we call as disobedience to the law or violation of the law. Right? Sa pan po, sa ating, uh, in our societies, we do not call it sin. We call it crime. We call it uh, violation of the law. Right? We do not call it sin. 
But in God's government, He calls it sin. Alright? So because we are talking about God's government, let, it, let us call it sin. Now there is one penalty for sin in God's government. And the penalty for sin, which is only one, is death. The wages of sin is death. That's according to Romans. Yeah. Death. The wages of sin is death. You remember when Adam and Eve uh, was commanded by God? He said to Adam and Eve, you see, there are so many trees in the garden. You may eat the fruit of all the trees except one. The one tree that is in the middle of the garden. Do not eat the fruit of that tree. For the moment you eat that fruit, you will surely die. He didn't say you will surely get sick. He didn't say you will get weak. No. He said you will surely die. Because in God's government, there is only one penalty for sin for disobedience, for violation of the law of God. And that is death. And this death is actually not the natural death that people experience. You might be thinking when somebody dies, oh, he has already paid for his sins. No, right? That is not the penalty for sin. That is actually the consequence of sin. Now, there is difference between penalty and consequence, right? And I will uh, give you an example. When I was a little kid, one of the rules of uh, my father, do not climb trees. Yeah. It's one of the rules in the house. But you know, kids, where, where do we get... Where do we get this idea of violating the rules, you know, of the house? It's here. So, I used to climb trees. For, for us, that it was very challenging to climb trees. Especially if you can climb at the top. It's some sort of an achievement. But one of the climbing sprees that we had, my brother and I fell. My brother was hurt uh, severely because uh, he fell uh, right on the post of defense. And he was tricked here. Well, I broke a little finger. And I felt that is what we call the consequence of disobeying the rule of my father. The consequence. And the penalty, the father, my father is very clear. If you climb trees, I will spank you. That's the penalty. And he, he had a, uh, you know, what we call as yantut. <laughs> it's, it's a hard, uh, long, you know, slim uh, kind of thing, you know. And he cut about a meter, and he was using that to spank us <laughs> when we get naughty. You know? And so we climbed the trees. And if we climb the trees and get caught, we will be spunk with that uh, stick. That's the penalty. But when we climb, we fell. And the consequence of that fall, my brother was tricked here. And I broke my finger. That's the consequence. My father said, we will get spun. And we got spun. Because that's the penalty. The natural death is the consequence of our sins. 
But the penalty for sin is what the Bible calls the second death. And in this second death, there is no more <coughs> resurrection. You will be dead forever. Right? Itong, this natural death that we all people suffer, you know, I don't know how many more years I have and I will face death. That's inevitable. That's the consequence of having sin. That is not the penalty for sin. The penalty for sin is still future. When Jesus comes again and he judges all, then the penalty for sin, for sin which is the second death, will be given to those people who deserve it. Now, so the question now is, the, other, the next question now is, how many people sin? According to the Bible, all have sin. In other words, all have violated one way or the other, uh, the laws of God. And therefore, all of us are facing the penalty of sin, which is the second death. All of us are facing that. That is good. That is bad news. Isn't that bad news? In fact, that is the worst news you will ever hear. That because you sin, you sin against God, against His law. You are bound for the second death. But even if that is bad news, we have good news in John 3.16. We have good news in John 3.16 because John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish. In other words, shall not experience the second death, which is the penalty for sin. That is the good news. And that is why we are studying this, this. Now, what did Jesus do so that we may not perish, right? Although we have sinned. What did Jesus do? Well, the Bible is very clear. And I'm I'm reading from 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. That's right, yes. For I delivered to you, this is the Apostle Paul writing to the believers, Christian believers in, uh, in uh, the city of Corinth during his time. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ, that is Jesus, died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried, and that he rose again, and the, again the third day according to the scriptures. So the testimony of the men of God who wrote the Bible is that Jesus Christ died for our sins. What does that mean? It means that he took the penalty of our sins upon himself. Instead of us being punished, he was punished for our sins. And because he was punished, if we believe that he was punished for our sins, we will not be punished for our sins. Isn't that wonderful? We have sinned against the law of God. And we deserve to be punished by the second death. But because God loves us so much, He sent Jesus Christ to be our substitute so that what God requires from us, and this is the second death, the penalty for sin, Jesus gave it to God. 
That is why those who believe in him shall not perish. Isn't that good? You know, sometimes, you know, when I'm alone, especially before I go to sleep, when I'm alone, I think about this, you know. I, I'm amazed and awed by the love of God. How could God do such a thing? How could God so love us? As to send his only begotten son to be our substitute before the divine justice and be punished for our sins so that we may go free. And you know what? Because of that, because of that truth, I always go to sleep peacefully. Knowing that whatever happens, even if I die one day, I will meet my Savior Jesus Christ and I will not be going to death. That for sure I know. And you can sleep very tight. Even if you have so many problems, you know, because you know in the final analysis of things, everything is going to be well. What matters is the end game. What matters is your eternal destiny. Our eternal destiny has already been secured by the Lord Jesus Christ. We can all sleep soundly. And no matter what happens in this life, we are assured of eternal life to come. Because of what Jesus Christ did for us. Yan po ang ibig sabihin ng John 3.16. And so let us thank Him. What a wonderful Savior we have in Jesus Christ. And I hope that, you know, as we study this more and more, our faith in Jesus Christ becomes stronger, right? more steadfast, that nothing, no problem in this world could ever shake our faith in Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this wonderful truth that those who believe in Jesus will not perish in the second death. Father, we thank you so much for your great love that caused you to send your Son to be our substitute before you, that he may do what we could not do for our own selves. Father, thank you so much for the assurance that we who believe in Jesus will never perish, but have eternal life with you. Bless the remaining parts of our worship, Heavenly Father, and continue to forgive us our sins. And bless us, Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.